2024. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Crawley. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, as a reminder, this is a public meeting and it is being recorded. For those of you who are calling in, please ensure that your line is muted. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion for the approval of the minutes for the October 3rd, to, um, October, geez. Is there approval of the minutes for the October 3rd and October 10th, 2024 briefing sessions and the October 1st and October 8th, 2024 general sessions? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. Yes. Thank you, the minutes have been approved. Thank you, we have the engineer. We have a public hearing for the resolution, 811-24. Can the clerk please read the public hearing? Resolution regarding plans approved for the Cook Road, County Road number 80 from Carl Road, County Road number 76 to Walford Street, Lighting Improvements Project, Clinton Township, Franklin County, Ohio. All right, I'd like to open, I'd like to open up the public hearing uh, for this resolution. Is there anyone here in the audience or online who'd like to speak at this public hearing? Okay, seeing that there are none, I'd like to close the public hearing and have the clerk read the resolution into the record. Resolution number 81124, plans approved for the Cook Road, County Road number 80 from Carl Road, County Road number 76 to Walford Street, Lighting Improvements Project, Clinton Township, Franklin County, Ohio. Good morning, Commissioners. Brad Foster, Franklin County Engineer. Commissioners, we got two uh, resolutions on the docket this morning. The first resolution authorizes plan approval for the Cook Road lighting improvements. This project is located in Clinton Township and will be constructed in 2025 and will install street lighting along the corridor. The lighting project is in advance of the Franklin County Engineers 2026 Cook Road corridor improvement project, which will improve Cook Road by adding curb and gutter, sidewalks, shared use path, and storm sewer improvements. Pending any questions, I ask for your approval. There are no comments or questions. Move for approval of resolution 811-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 811-24 has been adopted. Resolution number 812-24. Tool Design Group LLC Consulting Engineers appointed to assist the Franklin County Engineer in performing a feasibility study for the Clark State Road, County Road number 95, Shared Use Path Project, Jefferson Township, Franklin County, Ohio, in the amount of $69,400. Commissioners, our final resolution seeks approval for a contract with Tool Design Group, Consulting Engineers, to assist, with the, to assist the Franklin County Engineer by performing a feasibility study along Clark State Road, Shared Use Path Project. Tool Design is a women's business enterprise, local engineering firm, and was chosen via engineering based selection process. This is a collaborative project with, fi with financial par participation from the city of Gahanna and will evaluate alternate alignments of pedestrian connectivity along Clark State Road between Hamilton Road and Jefferson Community Park. Pending any questions, I ask for your approval. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 812-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 81224 has been adopted. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is the Treasurer's Office. Resolution number 81324, resolution modifying the point and pay contract approved under resolution number 985-21, authorizing a $1,000 increase to the not to exceed amount. The contract modification will make the total financial obligation of the contract not to exceed $6,000 in the amount of $1,000. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Dustin Kors. I'm the IT Director for the Franklin County Treasurer's Office. On December 14, 2021, the Board of Commissioners approved Resolution 985-21, which approved a contract between Point and Pay to accept online payments on behalf of the Treasurer's Office. The contract has the Treasurer's Office paying five cents per e-check transa transactions with a not to exceed limit of $5,000. Due to an increase in taxpayers making e-check online payments, the $5,000 limit will be insufficient for this year. I am requesting the approval of a contract modification increasing the not to exceed limit to $6,000. 
Barring any questions, I request your approval. If there are no comments or questions, I move for approval of Resolution 813-24. Okay. You second? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, second you. Yeah. Okay. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 81324 has been adopted. Um, okay. I'm sorry. The, uh, Franklin County Data Center. Uh, when we get there. Okay. Resolution number 81424. Resolution conditionally authorizing the Enterprise Telecommunications Solution Commitment, commitment with. Logicalis Incorporated. Good morning, Julie Lust with the Data Center, and with me today is Data Center CIO Adam Frumkin. Working with county administration, the auditor, clerk, and treasurer, we have determined that our legacy phone system no longer meets the needs of the agencies, courts, and boards that support services to the people and businesses of Franklin County. The Automatic Data Processing Board passed Resolution 24086 approving the Cisco Calling and Contact Center solution, offering a strategic advantage in how services are provided. The solution supports on-site, remote, and hybrid work environments, agile call centers and call trees, has enhanced security in line with guidance from the National Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security, and can ex has expanded innovation features such as language translation and streamlined workflows that will better deliver interactive outcomes internally and with our residents. The vendor offered a $100,000 discount if procurement was made by the 24th of this month. Instead, we offer this resolution of a conditional commitment to obtain the discount while we educate our agencies on how this innovation can transform their processes and while we perform vital business analysis for, of their users and how they will communicate in the future. Pending any questions, we respectfully request your approval of this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 81424. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 81424 has been adopted. Thank you. I'm sorry, one second. Doing three things at once. Community partnerships. Oh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. All right, uh, community partnerships. Resolution number 81524, resolution authorizing a COVID-19 recovery grant with Primary One Health to provide gap funding for the provision of pharmacy services. Good morning, commissioners, county administration, Curtis Brown, community partnerships administrator. This resolution will provide a COVID-19 grant to Primary One in the amount of $2,500,000 to provide gap funding uh, to provide gap funding to support an in-house pharmacy build-out and to expand their Centering Pregnancy program. Uh, the CEO of Primary One, Charlita Tavares, is available if there are any questions or concerns. Otherwise, uh, if there are no questions or concerns, I respectfully request the approval of this resolution. Thank you. Um, I see uh, our CEO here. I would ask you to come to the podium. I definitely want to, get in the name of transparency, I want to, transparency, want to make sure that we're very... Um, um, open about what's happening and, and kind of where things are. So um, welcome to 
Franklin County. Thank you very much, Commissioner Boyce and Commissioner Crawley. I appreciate the opportunity to come and share a couple of words with you. Uh, first of you, all, you thank can lower that podium. There's a little button on the oh, side there that just kind of lowers it for you. So you have all the technology. Yeah, there <laughs> we go. We've got those standards. Not, okay, that, that's, low, that's not that's that, that low, not that low, Curtis. Hard. Jeez, <laughs> she had to bend down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly appreciate having the opportunity. Um, COVID-19 has had a serious impact on all health and human services organizations. And so I'm speaking on behalf of all of the human services agencies in Franklin County who are doing their very best to serve all of our residents who have health and human services needs. And I know DCA Bivens knows very well how much uh, all of us are struggling. This resolution in particular will help us fill the gaps that the attacks by the manufacturers of our 340B pharmacy discount program have had on all FQHCs, but specifically those of us who have larger numbers of populations that we're serving. Uh, our, our gap is about $6 million in total. Um, our income in 2022 was about $11.5 million that came into Primary One Health through the 340B Pharmacy Discount Program. Our patients are saving lots of money, uh, real money, so that they can spend on child care or on rent or groceries. And so it's a program that has dual purposes, allows us to expand services for those who are underserved in our community, those who are uninsured, homeless, those who may be underinsured. And so the 340B Pharmacy Discount Program dollars have helped us to expand services to more patients in our community, more residents in our community. And then um, as the um, administrator for community partners, uh, partnerships shared, we also want to expand our centering pregnancy program. We still have abysmal uh, rates of infant mortality. We want to make sure our pregnant moms are getting the care that they need as soon as possible, uh, get those early pregnancy visits, ensure that moms know the ABCs, make sure that moms have a support network, and that's what centering pregnancy is all about, ensuring that moms are working together with women who are in the same gestation period, that they understand how their pregnancy is going to take place and build some relationships with other moms so that if they don't know the answer, maybe that other mom knows the answer. And so they work with their practitioner as well as the other women. I'm very happy to take any questions. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Ms. Tabarra. Uh, do you have any questions you want me to start? Oh. I don't okay. Have okay. Yeah, I, I do want to um, so zero in on what you talked about. What you, you to use your words, um, um, funding gap. Um, and one, let me just preface my comments with, um, you know, when you think about medical care and you think about health care, and particularly um, pharmaceutical needs. I mean, th those can be life saving, life altering um, um, needs for residents. And the FQHCs, what they do is they're particularly made for those who can't afford, who may not have private insurance or private resources. And so I just want to preface my comments with that, that at the end of the day, um, you know, that's our value set as a county is rooted in um, supporting that population, that safe, being the safety net. So I, I preface my comments there. But you mentioned the term gap, and I want to make sure that um, the game plan to uh, address the gap is um, A, documented for, with the county administrator, B, um, that we establish a regular cadence of uh, engagement. I know there's some, um, you know, I know that uh, Commissioner Carl, I know you talked to all the commissioners and administrator, but I wanna go a step further. I mentioned this to the administrator to ensure that we're in tune with the needs of the population that you serve, because no matter what, that population is our responsibility. And so I don't wanna lose sight of that, um, but if you could maybe just talk about the sustainability strategy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, going forward, and then more importantly, not more importantly, but as importantly, is um, 
included in that would be um, the um, cadence of communication with the administrator and perhaps deputy administrator to ensure that as things begin to progress, um, we're ahead of whatever that need or challenge is. Thank you, Commissioner Boyce, um, President uh, of the Commission. Um, first of all, absolutely, we're going to stay in regular communication. I think um, the resolution provides for monthly reports, uh, but the 340B pharmacy discount program has attacked our ability to serve our patients in the best way. The attacks come in multiple ways, but one of the ways is the manufacturers are saying you can only have one contract pharmacy. At this point, Primary One Health has over 187 contracts with pharmacies all across Central Ohio to make it easier for our patients to get the prescriptions that they need. We want um, to have contracts with those pharmacies where our patients are already going, whether they're, it's a Walgreens, a Walmart, a CVS, a Kroger, and to allow them to do it in their time frame. With one contract, all of our patients are not going to go to that one contract pharmacy. We know that. And so that means they're not going to get the discount. The patient isn't going to get the discount on the pharmaceuticals. And then we're not going to generate the revenue so we can see more patients within the community who need health care services. So one of the ways to attack that is to do your own in-house pharmacies. So the first pharmacy we're going to build out is the one on Agler Road. It's one of our larger sites. Our goal is, have, is to have a pharmacy in the north, south, east, and west part of the county so that our patients have ease of access. They're on bus lines so that they can get those pharmaceuticals while they come in to get their health care services. That'll stem the amount of money that's leaving Primary One Health to build out those uh, pharmacies. The other way we're going to attack this is to work with DCA Bivens uh, and her team. They're going to come out and help us to enroll as many of our patients who have lost their Medicaid eligibility during the COVID process. At that time, they didn't have to re-enroll. Now they do. And so many of our patients haven't re-enrolled. And so the mobile unit is going to come to several of our sites so that we can enroll as many of our patients who are not enrolled as possible. And then, as we shared earlier, the centering pregnancy, those are our most vulnerable patients. Those in our um, homeless or those without housing are most vulnerable patients, many times coming in in the third trimester. And so we're trying to do everything that we can to get them in in the first trimester so that the pregnancy is as healthy as possible the mom and the family gets as many services as they need from Primary One Health and our partners throughout the community. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you for that. And I, I'm glad you just emphasized, and I want the public to focus on that too, that this is um, as much about the patients and the people we serve as anything. So I want to focus on that. But DCA Bivens, if you, if you could, um, is the game plan then to, because this Medicaid enrollment component is um, really critical uh, in the big scheme of the care and the coverage. So are we going to um, maybe um, uh, assign someone to be over at primary one on a regular basis or at the facilities on a regular basis? I mean, besides the mobile units, are we gonna, is there a place where even gone beyond, because we can't have the mobile units there 24 to right. seven. So you know, are we gonna have someone uh, on site like, kind of like we do at Columbus State Absolutely. and some of the other places where they've got an office and they can make sure that people are being enrolled um, um, quickly and efficiently and all those things. Right. Thank you, um, Commissioner Joy Bivens, Deputy County Administrator of Health and Human Services. We met with the um, Director of Job and Family Services last week. We are putting together a team of folks who can assist with, because you have about how many patients, 20,000, 30,000? Almost 32 right now. 32, mm -hmm. right. So we want to make sure that um, Primary One has the robust capacity in order to ensure these folks are re-enrolled. Re now, during COVID, we didn't have to push the button for folks. You just stayed on. Now, we are currently right now in, in, in re-enrollment season, so I'm going to take the privilege. If you are on Medicaid, it is please make sure that you re-enroll. Um, 
There are so many options. You can go to the Job and Family County Job and Family Services website. It is online. But we're going to make sure that there is a team assigned to assist um, CEO Tavares um, with this um, with this effort, designated for primary one. And I'm going to say this because I have to because I was with the Human Services Chamber last week. For those of you who are saying, well, I wanted a case manager. Some of those folks only have they're only seeing five people. Thirty thousand is different. So we want to make sure that we support the the, the traffic. Thank you, DCA Bivens. It, it means a lot to the patients that we serve. Um, because many don't even know that they have to re-enroll. They were enrolled in Medicaid during COVID. They've never gone through this before. Yeah. The, the only thing, I, the last question I have, and I, I'm sure my colleagues have thoughts or, or questions, but, um, and that's the city of Columbus. You know, at, at the end of the day, I presume that most of the 30,000 folks that you serve are either Columbus residents or um, somewhere close to, you know, they're, they're part of our metropolitan um uh, geographic area. And so, um, Administrator Wilson, uh, I want to encourage you to be fully engaged with the city because, you know, these are the type of things that we have to partner in, you know. Um, at the end of the day, um, we we serve the same people, and um, that is, you know, health care is a, a very heavy cost burden, no matter how you look at it, no matter where it's coming from, you know. And so uh, the city um, resources should also be um, f fully, and I presume they are, I don't know if you wanna talk about that. If not, it's fine. But Administrator Wilson, I, I wanna encourage you to, and I know we have had conversations, but I'm, I wanna be on the record, um, honestly, uh, for these, this is why I'm saying these things here, because um, I think we should have a, you should have a sit down conversation representing the county with the, with the city folks, and that there should be, um, a uh, ongoing dialogue on not so much about primary one, but about healthcare service delivery for those who need it. And, and our best way to have a big picture sustainable strategy and plan. And, um, uh, and certainly primary one should be part of that, but, uh, but that's, that's, I really wanna see that in writing, especially as we go through our budget process uh, before it's coming yeah. out. Uh, Kenneth Wilson, County Administrator, uh, President Boyce, uh, Commissioner O'Grady, Commissioner Crowley. Yes, it is a, extremely important that um, myself and DCA Bivens are in uh, communications uh, with uh, the city's leadership as well as the leadership of Columbus Public Health because um, we <coughs> all have a very important collaboration with Primary Health One. Um, it's important that we are collectively on the same page because ultimately it's crucial that uh, we maintain infrastructure to support over 30,000 patients that receive critical health care services every day. We all know the investments that we have to make in health equity um, to try to uh, stem the tide and uh, maintain, um, uh, I would say, a a base level of services for our residents. But we know in areas such as infant mortality, um, the investments needed are many. And it's also not just money, but we gotta ensure that our policies and practices are, are uh, as tight as possible. So yes, we will, uh, President Boyce, Commissioner O'Grady, Commissioner Crowley, work with in partnership with Primary Health and uh, our partners uh, in the city of Columbus uh, to maintain um, this health safety net in, in the infrastructure. And uh, in, in finally, in closing, uh, all of the work that we've been doing since 2018 and beyond uh, under the Poverty Blueprint, the Rise Together Plan, healthcare is one of the planks uh, of that plan. And we really can't afford to lose ground. We gotta try to do everything we can to maintain the safety net. Well said, well said. Um, let me open it up to uh, any questions. Or okay. uh, Commissioner Crowley. Thank you, President Boyce. Thank you, uh, Senator Tavares, for being here. I, I just want to um, say I know that uh, the reporting is, uh, I think, in the contract, like you said, uh, once every um, once a month. I did, in full transparency, ask the administrator in. DCA Bivens, if it could be bi-weekly, um, because we are talking about 10,000, we're talking about 32,000 um, of our neighbors. 
and, um, and, and for you to see us as a true partner, you know, as a true partner, not just a grantor, but a true partner um, in navigating the gap um, and, and providing support to um, you and, and our residents. And so um, hopefully that's not too cumbersome, but I think as there's check-ins with the commissioners, um, mine are bi-weekly, Administrator Wilson is every week, we can stay abreast of, um, of changing things and then get updates on what's happening with the, with the partnership with the city. But I also want to just say thank you for all that you continue to do for our residents. Um, from the time you are on city council to the legislature to now, you have always um, advocated for health care and looked out for the, the people that we're talking about today, those who have no insurance or are underinsured. Um, and thank you for your ongoing advocacy. Uh, I can't, I can't, um, overstated enough uh, that you do not have to do this work and you continue to show up each and every single day. And for that, I thank you. Especially today when there was a dispatch article that talked about the infant mortality rate increasing here in Franklin County, but across the whole country after the Dobbs decision that um, infant mortality rates um, here in Franklin County went from overall uh, 7.06 deaths per 1,000 um, birth to 7.11 and even though that may be a small increase it is still a life that is lost an infant death um, and that means that we are um, trekking in the wrong direction uh, after having a county that continues to invest um, heavily in health equity but we see as um, has been stated before policies legislation changes that impact real lives every single day. Um, and so the work that you all do at Primary One Health is needed um, probably even more today than ever before. And so um, again, see us as a true partner. I know you have, um, but as you navigate this, um, and thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Crawley, um, certainly uh, President Boyce and Commissioner O'Grady, I really appreciate all the support that this commission has provided to Primary One Health, uh, certainly to all of our residents who are in need within the community because we don't stand alone as a health care provider. We have to have those other partners, um, those that are in our human services ecosystem. Our patients, our community residents need multiple services and that's why the Rise Together Innovation uh, Institute and the blueprint are so critical to the work that we're all doing. Uh, all of those pillars that are lifted up in the blueprint are, are partners in the human services, health and human services ecosystem, whether it's education, whether it's jobs, whether it's health care, whether it's food insecurity, all of those partners have to come together to serve the residents who are in need. Um, and so I appreciate the focus of this commission if it weren't for the blueprint, many of us would still be out there by ourselves, not working together, and not serving our residents in the most efficient, effective way. So I look forward to the continuing um, check-ins and partnerships, not only with the county, but as you said, with the city of Columbus as well. Um, they, quite frankly, were the ones that found it, um, formerly known as Columbus Neighborhood Health Center, Inc. Uh, we were the first, we're the largest um, FQHC in Central Ohio, and as uh, President Boyce shared, there are more FQHCs now, and I'm a firm believer that we should be spending more dollars on health care as there are more partners taking care of more of the Franklin County residents, City of Columbus residents. Mm -hmm. um, I want my partners to do well in this community, and I want them to be able to serve more residents of this community. We can't do it by ourselves, but we can't spend the same money and expect that we're going to serve more residents. And um, that's part of what's going on right now. It's hurting our community residents who need health care because you can't take from one and give to another and expect you're going to serve as many patients. Uh, we served a high of 48,000 patients in 2019. 
Uh, COVID knocked a lot of those patients out and um, we're slowly crawling back to that high number again. Um, we'll probably close out the year with about 35 to 38,000, but we need to get back to 48,000 plus. You know, Senator, oftentimes I sit up here and think to myself, after everything, you know, after my colleagues speak, and this goes beyond just this board, my previous colleagues as well, oftentimes I sit here and I think, well, everything's been said. I don't really need to say anything. And this morning, obviously, I think everything kind of has been said, but I do want to say one final thing. And, you know, my colleagues, my colleague, Commissioner Crowley, talked about health equity. Um, you know, with all the work that we've done over the years in the area of um, poverty and, and the work that we've done um, with our citizens and our residents that are most in need, um, the one area that I believe, you know, when, when you're, when we work with, with, our, with our residents that, that, that um, truly need the most help from, from us, uh, the one area that I think is, is um, and, and we can argue and, and discuss what is the most, the, the most beneficial thing that we provide. But <clears throat> when, you're, when you're struggling and when you're, when you're in need, uh, healthcare, you know, really needing to be able to see a doctor, reading, really needing to be able to go see a nurse, we just go, needing that, that, um, that care when you're not feeling well, when something's going wrong, uh, to me is, you know, at the end of the day is, is I mean, you know, we all, you know, every family needs child care. Every family needs a roof over their head. Every family needs to be fed at the end of the day. But, you know, from, from my own personal lived experience, you know, uh, needing to go see the doctor, needing to be able to get that medical attention. Um, and so the, the, the care that you provide and the, and the resource that you provide uh, for those 32,000 uh, of, our, of our residents every day is critical. So the partnership that we have with you uh, is, is something that uh, we value and we appreciate you being here today to, to, you know, to talk about it, but also to, uh, uh, to renew the partnership. And so thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Commissioner O'Grady. I, I, again, thank all of the commissioners, Crawley, Boyce, O'Grady. But I also want to give um, a shout out to the team, uh, because if not for uh, Administrator Wilson, Deputy County Administrator Bibbins, uh, Zach Tallerack and certainly Curtis Brown, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And so I want everyone to know that I really appreciate the administration. Um, you all are the team that community partners, community organizations and agencies really need. And as Commissioner O'Grady just shared, uh, I've, I've coined this phrase since my time in the legislature. If your health care needs are not addressed, our children aren't ready to learn, and our adults are not ready to earn. And so we've got to do what's needed to be done so that people are ready to take on life's challenges. And health care is the basics. Um, I've lost people prematurely. My own dad died prematurely at 48 of a massive heart attack. And so this is a part of my DNA. I can't walk away from it because I've seen too many people, people of color dying prematurely, people not getting the care that they need because they're economically challenged, and people feeling as though they don't deserve health care. So thank you for your comments, and I appreciate this partnership and look forward to our continuing uh, check-ins. Yeah, I would just say that Staff, they are right. <laughs> yeah, they are right. You know these folks here. Yeah, you get all these. They are right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna they give okay. a shout out to my team member. Um, Nicole Gomez has been going through this struggle with me. She's our um, chief operations officer. Uh, we're changing her title. It was called something else, but. She's been a part of this um, effort to 
really focus in on the build out of these in-house pharmacies because it's going to help our patients tremendously. You know, Trinita, this, this, I appreciate you mentioning the staff because this staff, we, we like to talk about how we are literally one of the very few of the best counties in, in the United States, 3,069 counties, and Franklin County is, is amongst, you know, the best. Um, and the reason that we are is because of the staff that you mentioned, uh, from the administrator all the way across the board, to the frontline staff that does the work day in and day out. Uh, the staff, I mean, we, we get the glory. Uh, we, we're the ones that get to, you know, get, get the recognition, but the staff are the ones that do the work day in and day out, and they're the ones that make us look good. So appreciate you recognizing the staff. Thank you. And I want to say a shout out to my partner, Chris Long, who DCA <laughs> uh, Long, because we worked a lot on um, the jail, the Franklin County Jail. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Sorry, I got like 90 things going on at once here. Um, Thank you. I can see there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 815-24. Second. We've been seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 815-24 has been adopted. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Resolution number 827-24. Resolution authorizing a contract agreement with Rossetti Enterprises, LLC, to provide closing remarks at the second Franklin County Board of Commissioners Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference in the amount of $6,000. Good morning, um, Commissioners, County Administration. This is Danielle DeVoice, DEI Program Administrator with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We are hosting the second Franklin County Board of Commissioners Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference, celebrating differences and building inclusive futures on Tuesday, October 22nd, and Wednesday, October 23rd. The conference is designed for those interested in learning more about how to best serve and support Franklin County's ever-changing landscape and its multitude of diverse residents. The DEI conference will host four different workshops focusing on economic equity, community engagement, accessibility, and mental wellness. These workshops will be interactive and actionable so participants can leverage and implement the takeaways in a practical way and return to their partners and organizations. The closing keynote remarks for the Board of Commissioners Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference will be provided by Rosemary Rossetti, consultant, author, and leading disability inclusion ex expert in the universal design and accessibility. Rosemary founded Rosetti Enterprises, LLC, in 1997, which is a local disability and woman-owned business enterprise. In 2001, she created Rosemary Rossetti Spinal Cord Injury Research Fund, which works in partnership with The Ohio State University to advance the cure for spinal cord injuries. This event will be a catalyst for creating a more diverse, <coughs> equitable, inclusive, and accessible world of work. In collaboration with the community partners and organizations, we will help shape workplace policies. Additionally, we will provide support for our new American immigrant, refugee, and disabled residents and continue engaging small minority-owned businesses enterprises. Excuse me. Pending any questions or comments, I respectfully request your approval on this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 827-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 827-24 has been adopted. Resolution number 828-24, resolution authorizing a contract agreement with Encore to supply audiovisual services for the second Franklin County Board of Commissioners Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference in the amount of $19,722.02. Supporting our diversity, equity, and inclusion event in the AV realm will be Encore, which has a global and local network of audio and visual industry experts that will assist in delivering an unparalleled in-person experience for the conference. From local government actions to innovative nonprofit work, this event will encourage us to prioritize accessibility from the start, promote inclusiveness, and ensure everyone can experience Franklin County equitably. Pending any questions or comments, I respectfully request your approval on this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval resolution 827-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crowley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 828-24 has been adopted. 
Resolution number 81624, resolution authorizing a grant agreement with the Columbus CEO Collective for the creation of a minority business ecosystem focusing on enhancing and supporting minority businesses overall well-being while emphasizing and addressing the racial wealth gap in the amount of $700,000. Columbus CEO Collective is a nonprofit 501c3 organization established in 2020 whose mission is to provide leadership, access, and advocacy for black wealth building and economic mobility to contribute to the economic growth of Central Ohio. The Columbus CEO Collective's programs aim to support minority businesses and entrepreneurs striving to improve their businesses' well being with a strong emphasis on addressing the racial wealth gap for minority businesses. This organization focuses on enhancing business readiness through educational training, workshops, and addresses barriers with minority businesses in several areas including education, convening, information, sharing, black business ecosystem building, advocacy, wealth building, and capital access. The Columbus CEO Collective will serve a total of 1,000 minority businesses in a 12-week program that offers workshops and classes. This collaboration will provide essential opportunities and resources to engage more minority business entrepreneurs, there, thereby addressing and reducing racial economic disparities. This res resolution supports the Rise Together Blueprint Goal Number 2, eliminating um, systematic class, racial, gender, and disability wage gaps in employment. Dr. Elizabeth Joy, President and CEO of the Columbus CEO Collective, is here joining us virtually to answer any questions you may have. And pending any questions or comments, I respectfully request your approval on this resolution. I think she's on. Dr. Joy, do you have any comments you'd like to share? Good, good morning, um, Commissioner Boyce, Commissioner Crawley, uh, Commissioner O'Grady. Administrator Wilson, I apologize. I'm actually at the National Minority Supplier Diversity Council Conference, obviously an important connection to the work we're doing. Um, I will just say that I'm grateful for the opportunity to partner and even listening to CEO um, Tavares talk about the importance of partnership. All the work we're doing is really focused on um, obviously the core mission of addressing um, our growing economic equity issue in Franklin County and Columbus, um, but also doing that in a partnership uh, capacity in which we have aligned with the city and county on this work, as well as the many other amazing folks that are doing great work um, on this issue. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to partner and um, for your funding support. Thank you. Uh, I just, a couple of things. One, um, want to say that um, I think a thousand businesses, uh, uh, minority businesses, is aggressive in a year to get to, um, and so I'm, I'm eager to see your plan and strategy um, for that. And uh, I think it'd be great. I think it's a great number, but that, but that's a lot of businesses, uh, and so I'm, I'm eager for that. Um, two, I want to, and I, and I, and I don't, don't take yeah. this as a, a target for you. This is really all agencies, everybody that gets funds, especially first-time funds is that you know there I've read through the um, the uh, contract and through the uh, proposal and what I don't see is the sustainability strategy going past this allocation of funding because um, uh, Administrator Wilson says my understanding this is considered one time kind of funding but based on the strategy the work which seems all critical is something that um, will will need to evolve over time uh, and we'll, we'll need work over time. So I just want to emphasize again the sustainability um, component outside of these funds because, you know, very nothing, nothing for something to happen big in a year is difficult. And while you had an aggressive uh, structure here, uh, I think that's, that's ambitious and great, but I know that this work is over time, you know, and and so sustaining it, if these if these funds are not reallocated next year, is important, and it's more important that we understand that as we put these funds out there now. Unless you had intentions otherwise, but um, I just always feel compelled, particularly for first time grantees, uh, that that's outlined. I also uh, got with the administrator, and I have a couple of other questions that I think he's going to get with you on later. But um, um, Administrator Wilson, do you want to respond to that, or, or um, yes. Dr. Joy? Okay. Um, I'll allow uh, Dr. Joy to comment, but Kenneth Wilson, County Administrator, 
Um, we, um, in county administration and our DEI office, uh, our uh, chief economic inclusion officer, um, D'Amica Weathers, worked extensively um, with uh, Dr. Joy uh, and other uh, individuals within the Columbus CEO Collective. Um, what we envisioned was um, up to a one-year um, funding commitment. Uh, so this goes through uh, July 31st of 2025. We want to look at the outcomes that are built into uh, this agreement and evaluate an extension. That was the understanding that we've been working under with the collective. Uh, because we realize that we need additional partners to come uh, forward, as you stated, uh, so that this organization is sustainable. Uh, but we want to evaluate this. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the first um, introductory uh, call um, that I uh, was a part of, along with uh, Jason uh, uh, from the City of Columbus, uh, their DEI. Uh, director, their Director of Diversity, uh, Equity, and Inclusion, Jason Simmons, along with um, Sean Grant uh, from the Columbus Partnership, who is founder of this organization, uh, to have conversations to sort of lay uh, the groundwork uh, for uh, monthly conversations and other direct support um, to create, to be a part of creating an ecosystem um, that will um, encourage um, businesses of color um, to consider entrepreneurship, to consider uh, building their existing uh, businesses if they uh, already have uh, established within Franklin County. Uh, this is viewed as just one of several strategies that this board uh, has been a part of. Uh, because of this board, because of your leadership, uh, President Boyce, uh, Commissioner O'Grady, and, and Commissioner Crowley, we're seeing freedom equity uh, continue to grow as uh, the first um, CDFI focus on working with business of color. We created the equity fund. Uh, Friday, we have a conversation sponsored by our DEI office uh, in concert with uh, the state of Ohio um, minority to business minority business uh, program uh, and others and starting today our DEI conference so this is a continuation of the work uh, but to answer your question we're looking at a one this is I'm considering this as a one-year pilot and this is the first uh, phase of, uh, of a one-year pilot but we want to evaluate it based upon um, the performance measures that uh, Chief Withers worked with uh, the collective on. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Administrator Wilson. I would just say, Dr. Joy, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to use these funds as leverage to raise additional dollars, you know, whether it's from the businesses that you're serving at the city of Columbus, uh, other municipalities. I mean, <coughs> everyone in the region will benefit from the work of the collective. And so it's really important that as you um, develop the um, um, the process, I don't know the right words, lost words here, but um, that you, that you um, create the sustainability effort and the revenue, the other sources of, of uh, resources is how I would describe that. And so I would, I just wanna encourage you to um, use this as a mechanism to engage the city of Columbus, engage some of the uh, other municipalities, maybe some of the other um, business serving entities, um, and really sort of create a, um, a longer term you know, strategy because well, here's what I know for sure, and, I, and this is definitely not directed at you uh, or the collective, but here's what I know for sure. You know, we, we're constantly um, managing resources and um, um, every time we make these kinds of appropriations, and we get you know strong and aggressive and creative with with this kind of work. It, it usually works out, but then it's sustaining the work over time that becomes the challenge. And when folks haven't sort of figured out that broader strategy, it, it puts us in position a tough position when cuts have to be made. Um, and we're dealing with that in this budget cycle already. And 
from, from COVID funds. So I just, I want to always emphasize that, especially to new grantees, um, uh, because it's just, you know, there are limited resources and this is excellent, excellent strategy and work, but um, I don't, what, I, what I'm always fearful of is starting something and then the expectation is, okay, a year later we've solved some major problem and then, but, you know, it, you know, that's not how that's not how any of this works. You know, it takes time. It takes a commitment over years to really move the needle. Um, you can't unwind what has been a lifetime worth of damage in a year. And it just I don't care what the subject matter is. And so um, <coughs> I get skeptical when um, I don't see the the plan to to maintain funding. So I I, I don't mean to sound like I'm lecturing you because that, that's not my intent. I just I'm really here supporting. We're trying to do just trying to make sure we're we're all thoughtful about how to sustain the the real work that will take a long time to to address. I appreciate your feedback, Commissioner Boyce, and I will tell you that uh, it took us since we started in 2020. We've been very intentionally, quite frankly, I would say slow. Anyone who knows the numbers as it relates to economic equity will know that it's all an emergency. However, we disciplined ourselves to, to really be intentional in moving forward in designing this work. Um, I didn't want to bore you all with too many of the details when we submitted our uh, proposal, but um, the numbers are aggressive, but again, because we are building this work 100% through partnerships, there's nothing we're doing alone in any of this work. So Adelphi Bank, which obviously shout out to you for your vision in that, uh, Ohio Minority Supplier Diversity Council, the Minority Business Development Agency, uh, Chief Womack over at the state. Uh, we've been leading work um, in the state for connecting intel to minority business businesses in our state who would obviously have potentially life-changing and business-changing opportunities through that large, impactful project, but agreed 100% that um, the numbers are aggressive and agreed 100% that long-term strategy is in order, agreed 100% that we will be leveraging this, and, and this is why this is so important. Our first commitment came from the Columbus um, foundation and it was a three-year commitment at hundred thousand dollars each year this builds on top of that and of course to your point we certainly will leverage this to build from here and we are looking at social enterprise approaches as well um, i don't think that any program that's fully dependent upon grant funding is ever able to get that comfortable because as you said uh, we're always at risk for cuts to happen and so um, I note and appreciate all of your thoughts and um, feedback on this, and certainly we'll look forward to engaging you in some conversations about ideas you have and, and other partnerships we can explore. Thank you. All right. If there are no additional comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 816-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crowley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 81624 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Economic Development Planning. Resolution number 81724, resolution to conditionally approve the emergency transfer plan for the emergency solutions grant program and continuum of care for victims of domestic violence, dating violence, and or stalking. Good morning, commissioners. Emanuel Torres, Assistant Director of Economic Development and Planning. Franklin County, Ohio, is, uh, as an entitlement urban county, is required by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to adopt an emergency transfer plan in compliance with the requirements of Title 24 of the Code of Se uh, Federal Regulations, Section 576.409F, for applicable activities which are covered by the violence against women act this resolution will conditionally approve the draft emergency transfer plan condition upon formal hud approval uh, edp agency will provide the commissioner's clerk's office with the official hud approval for generalizing once it's received and pending any questions i respectfully request your approval of this resolution 
there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 8 18 24. I'm sorry, 8 17 24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution 817 24 has been adopted. Resolution number 81824, First Amendment to the Economic Development Agreement between Franklin County Board of Commissioners and the Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio, also known as Aspire, to support the Women Back to Work Initiative and Workforce Development Training Programs in the amount of $240,526.51. Commissioners, on October 12, 2021, the Board of Commissioners approved resolution number 775-21 and entered into an agreement with the Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio, also known now as Aspire, for the provision of $2,537,300. Uh, this amendment addresses the name change of the Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio pursuant to the documents recently filed with the Ohio Secretary of State. Their name has been changed to Aspire. A component of the agreement was to produce a one-day event to provide women of Franklin County whose employment have been impacted due to the COVID-19 pandemic information on job opportunities, training and education, financial support, mental health support, and coaching sessions on career planning. The total cost of that event uh, came in under budget. Aspire requested to amend the agreement to allow for the reallocation of unspent money in the amount of $240,526.51 from the one-day event budget to their workforce development training programs budget. Uh, this First Amendment to the agreement will allow for the reallocation of these unspent funds to the training funds budget uh, to further support Aspire in its efforts to provide workforce development and training opportunities to the residents of Franklin County. With us today, we have CEO Lisa Pat McDaniel from Aspire to share some highlights on the outcomes of uh, their initiatives, after which, and pending any questions, I respectfully request your approval of this resolution. Good morning. First of all, I want to uh, thank President Boyce, Commissioner Crawley, and Commissioner O'Grady for investing this money with Aspire. You are investing this money with the residents of Franklin County, and we've had really wonderful results. I do want to address the event. We were um, thrilled to have Commissioner Crawley uh, actually be at the event and be interviewed on her career journey, and that made a real impact on the women who attended. Uh, the event, though, we were able to bring it in much under uh, cost, which was wonderful. Some of that was uh, the money we were able to put in and invest ourselves. Some of that uh, was our ability just to manage it well. Uh, but we are faced with uh, more people coming to the Job Center than we've ever had before. Uh, this last year, we were approaching 12,000 people coming and interacting with the Job Center. And um, that's not counting our 15 community partners now in our Central Ohio Workforce Development Network who are touching over 55,000 people last year. All of them, um, many of them are actually in need of skill acquirement and better jobs. And uh, although the board prioritizes training uh, as much as we can with the core funding that we get from the federal government, uh, the additional $1.5 million that the commissioners gave as part of this agreement uh, was sorely needed and has been almost completely spent. So we are respectfully asking that this additional money from the event be moved over to training. Some of the um, things we have done, uh, I just want to talk again about the women at work so you know, that uh, we had eight cohorts. We had close to 400 women apply to get into the program. The space we had was for 150, so any of the women who uh, did not get into the program were uh, directed over to the job, seeker, job, seeker, job center excuse me, for the regular services that we provide. Uh, but the women who were in this model of the cohort they are still interacting 
uh, and supporting each other. So we think the model that we used, using a cohort model, uh, providing additional leadership, uh, life coaching and planning in addition to uh, looking for jobs was really successful. We had an average wage increase with those women of $11 an hour, but you have to remember that many of those women came to us and had, were not working because of the pandemic, which was the point of the program. So that probably skewed our wages higher. Um, most of the women are working at a wage of over $22 per hour. And although I, I say in every forum, $22 an hour is still not enough for uh, a household to maintain a sustainable lifestyle here. Uh, it is certainly a uh, big jump. So we've been really proud of what happened with Women at Work. And as promised, we're going to take the lessons we've learned, which we're currently um, talking about how we can put them into how we do work at the Job Center going forward. Uh, the money for training, if this money is approved to go into training, we will be able to train an additional 25 to 35 job seekers before June. Uh, it just depends on the kinds of training that they want to go into. Training costs quite a bit of money. Um, our tech boot camps are costing over 15000 um, for that training, and those are the jobs that get us the highest wage increase. So, but the primary places we're investing in job training are in technology, in healthcare, advanced manufacturing, and then we've put aside some for uh, other kinds of training that will result, in all cases, we're aiming for that $22 or plus over an hour. So I can tell you that um, this money is being well invested, and we're not just about training. I, I keep mentioning the wage because I want you to understand that we are about employment. And so uh, we work very hard to make sure that everybody who completes a certification is getting employed with the use of that certification in the jobs here in Franklin County. We are a blessed area. We have plenty, plenty of jobs. So that's not the issue. The issue is having people have the skills to get those jobs. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Boyce. Thank you for being here. Um, and I did have a, a really good time um, last year at the summit and then being able to speak to uh, some of the uh, women who were, one, excited to be there um, and connect with other women, but also just all of the things that you all provide um, to those who are not working or looking to change careers. Um, and so one of the questions that I had, since you were talking about the um, average of the wage um, and how most of the women were not working, but then you helped get them gainfully employed, do you know um, how many women that has been over the time of the, um, I think, the last grant? How, how many have been? How many have were not working that you helped get employed? Oh, yes. Yeah. Actually, I do have some of those numbers, so uh, let me share them with you. Uh, so of uh, the women who came into the program um, at the very beginning, uh, only about 20% of them uh, were employed when they came into the program. So they may have been employed pre-pandemic. Uh, and we're able to get some kind of employment, which meant we have 51% uh, who uh, reported that they were currently unemployed. And then we had, um, let's see, about 11% who were uh, part-time or underemployed. So, uh, so far, and we're still wrapping up statistics because we finished in June, and we still have women reporting additional employment. So. But for right now, um, let's see. I'm looking at finding my statistics here. But uh, of the 100, uh, 138 women who persisted all the way to the end, uh, employment is around 75%. And that last 25%, that may go up as we uh, follow, continue to follow up with women. And if they still haven't been employed, I'm thinking of one woman in particular who came to us um, and uh, is 
still completing certifications, so some of them may still be in training. But I think it's been, uh, it's run about the same as our general programs. Somewhere around 70 to 80% get it employed immediately. For the women who did not complete or go all the way through, do, what were some of the reasons? Did you do outreach? Can you talk about what barriers may have come up um, that had them not be able to complete the program? A lot of those barriers are related to child care, honestly. <laughs> so the work you do in child care is greatly appreciated, but the ability to have child care as an example. Some women came in and wanted to get into health care, uh, and when they looked at the wages, you know, nursing is always very popular because nursing pays a great wage. But if you're a single mom, uh, you have to have hair, uh, child care available to you possibly over night shifts, uh, even if you're in some of the entry level in healthcare, you know, you're, you're possibly gonna be on that second or third shift. And so some of it was childcare related. Some transportation, we are definitely seeing an uptick over all our pro programs in uh, the inability to get to where people need to go uh, to find a job. Um, we had, um, some of the women culturally were having issues with taking on full-time work uh, based on their family's um, demands and culture. So those were some of the reasons, but childcare would be one of the number one reasons. Thank you. Um, I would just say, if you don't mind, President yes. Boyce, that I think this is a place where um, I continue to say we need more alignment and more partnership. If we are already providing um, funding to make sure uh, people can be gainfully employed, we would hate for them to leave par through the program because of a barrier for like childcare right. when we still have Franklin County Rise Child Care Initiative. So we would probably try to prioritize those families and getting scholarships if they didn't qualify for publicly funded child care. If they're underemployed um, in, in a program, they probably qualify for a publicly funded child care. But for those that you get employed, help gain employment, if they don't qualify, then you have Franklin County Rise um, mm -hmm. child care initiative that will help offset some of those costs. Um, and so I just, that's for administration or um, and as well as economic development and planning that we do have a resource available and so our program should be just a little bit or programs that we're supporting should be a little bit more aligned um, so we can really have the impact that we're trying to have especially for women that's on the benefits cliff so. right absolutely that's one of the again that's the number one issue that the board uh, is concerned about is having adequate child care for everybody, and and especially in those, uh, you know, that second and third shift. And we incentivize right? um, providers yeah. through that yeah. child care initiative too. So providers or people who are on listening, if you know a provider, um, there is a considerable amount of grant funding available through the child care initiative to serve uh, people on second and third shift or our first responders. Um, that is one of the priorities or main components of that initiative is because we know people, um, one, have to leave the workforce because they don't have childcare, but the demand for um, that 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. hours mm -hmm. is very um, is very high. So um, right. there's a resource out there. Yes, so and we appreciate it. and brag about that resource to other counties, just so you know. Oh, well, thank you, but tell the people about it. <laughs> Commissioner, if I could just really quick, thank you. Um, um, CEO, appreciate you coming down. One of the reasons why I asked about the status report was the thing so that we can look at some of those things. If we can have the opportunity to have the edu early education administration team come in and educate the board on RISE, what it is, I know I'm a board member, if we can have them do that. In addition to working with the Workforce Development Board in assisting and stabilizing the child care industry in this community looking at innovative ways because there are folks who have left to go pick and pack and we needed them in the classroom because of the higher wages, right? right? But if we can work with you all on that, that would be great. But the first thing, if we can just come in and just talk about all the supportive services so that you all are educated. It's kind of hard to do that during these board meetings and committee meetings because right. they're so structured. But if we, we will be willing to do that. Well, and we could do another one of the, uh, we've started to do webinars so that our board members can be educated on what we call kind of workforce adjacent issues, childcare being one of them. And so that's also another avenue that we could use 
because I know they're very interested in it. And as far as the uh, workforce, that, yes, that's a wicked policy problem, is it not? Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had started a conversation about potentially looking at uh, using apprenticeship as a way to have child care workers trained uh, when the as we all know, when the pandemic happened, some of these conversations fell off. And I do feel it's something that we need to pick up, especially because Aspire just received a Department of Labor, Labor $4 million grant to help build apprenticeship. And so that's one of the areas we want to look at. Well, if there are no additional comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 818-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner O'Grady. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. <clears throat> yes. Resolution 818-24 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Adopt family services. Resolution number 819-24. Resolution approving subboard amendments with Community Refugee and Immigration Services, Ethiopian Tiwahedo Social Services, Jewish Family Services, and Us Together Incorporated for Refugee Employability Services in the amount of $3,657,176.02. Good morning, Commissioners and County Administration. Carmen Barnes, Assistant Director, Job and Family Services. Franklin County receives Refugee Support Services Award dollars which we use to support our RSS Collaborative of Community Partners. That includes Community Refugee and Immigration Services, or CRIS, Ethiopian Tewahedo Social Services, also known as ETSS, Jewish Family Services, and Us Together. Over the past two years, the Collaborative has connected more than 1,100 eligible refugees with workplace English language instruction, basic employability instruction, job placement assistance, and job retention services. The refugees attaining employment have earned, on average, a starting wage of $17.25 per hour. Under this amendment, the partners will continue to work together to offer program services designed to address the employment challenges that are specific to this population. This latest tranche of funding will allow the partners to serve approximately 980 refugees throughout Central Ohio during this award period. Pending any questions, we ask for your approval of this resolution. <coughs> if there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 819-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 819-24 has been adopted. Thank you. Sanitary engineers. Resolution number 820-24. Resolution finding it necessary to acquire real property for the purpose of constructing a sanitary sewer pump station and associated infrastructure in connection with the Timberbrook Pump Station Replacement Project and approving a contract with Christina Munoz Nedro for the purchase of a 5.89 acre property in the amount of $90,000. Good morning, Commissioners and County Administration. I'm Ryan Stowe, the Assistant Director of Sanitary Engineering. We are requesting the approval of a contract to purchase a 5.89 property in Norwich Township from the owner, Christina Nedro, for $90,000. The county currently has an easement on this property for our Timberbrook pump station. This pump station has reached the end of its useful life and is in need of replacement. To facilitate the construction of the new pump station, it was determined that it would be most beneficial for the county to purchase the entire parcel on which the current pump station sits. Sanitary Engineering has worked closely with the prosecutor's office to negotiate a just and equitable price for the property. This resolution asks for the approval of the contract with the owner, the authorization of, of the county administrator to execute that contract, the approval of the $90,000 PO, and to execute and accept the deed by the Board of Commissioners. Pending any questions or comments, I respectfully request the approval of this resolution. Now, if there are no comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 8 2024. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 8 2024 has been adopted. Resolution number 8 2124. Resolution authorizing a contract with Proho Enterprises LLC for the sanitary sewer connections of 
single family residences in the money back and Brown Road East service areas round three in the amount of $620,759.09. Sanitary sewers in the money back and Brown Road East services service area became available for connection in the late November of 2017. Per Ohio Revised Code, each property is required to connect. Financial assistance was available to residential homeowners who met all requirements of the program. 54 applications were received and reviewed, and of those, 25 were approved for assistance. Proposals for RFP 2024-09-24 were received only from one contractor on August 20th of this year. Upon review and in evaluation of the proposals, Proho Enterprises LLC was determined to be the lowest and best proposal. The county and Proho Enterprises LLC have agreed to a contract value of $620,759.09 to provide all labor and materials necessary to connect each of the 25 homes. This contract also includes a contingency of $56,433. The cost of the connections will be funded by the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency's Oh, Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and Ohio Water Development Water Development Authority Water Pollution Control Loan Fund, whose applications were approved via resolution 164-20. The duration of the project will be 180 days and all work will be inspected by sanitary engineering staff. Pending any questions or comments, I respectfully request the approval of this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 821-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner O'Grady. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. Yes. Resolution number 821-24 has been adopted. Thank, Thank you. you. Public facilities management. Resolution number 822-24, resolution authorizing a transfer of appropriations for general fund operations. Good morning, commissioners. Darla Reardon, director. Public facilities management is responsible for the facility needs of the various agencies and offices of Franklin County. This resolution authorizes a transfer of appropriations within the general fund to support various facility operational needs through year end. We appreciate OMB's guidance and assistance with this request. Pending any questions, PFM requests your approval of this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 822-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 822-24 has been adopted. Resolution number 823-24, resolution authorizing a contract agreement with CK Construction Group Incorporated to provide construction manager at risk services including pre-construction services associated with planning, design, and new construction of the new Franklin County downtown facility, which includes the Early Learning Center, in the amount of $77,775. Request for qualifications number 2023-0359 requested submissions from interested parties with proven experience to provide construction manager at risk services associated with the planning, design, and construction of a new Franklin County downtown facility, which includes the new Early Learning Center. Five submissions were received in response to the RFQ, and three firms were shortlisted to the request for proposal phase. CK Construction Group, Inc. exhibited that it has the capacity, qualified staff, and resume of work experiences to provide the required construction management services, including pre-construction services. During this pre-construction services phase, the scope of work with CK Construction Group, Inc. includes, but is not limited to, schedule and cost estimate development, a guaranteed maximum price proposal, subcontractor pre-qualification and bidding, constructability reviews, permits, budgeting, value engineering, and pre-construction planning throughout this pre-construction services phase. Future amendments are anticipated in 2025 for the construction services phase of the project. CK Construction Group, Inc. is a local construction management firm and has partnered with 3C Industries, Inc., a local minority business enterprise MBE construction management consultant. 
There is an established 20% SEBE aspirational goal for the new Franklin County Downtown Facility Construction Project, which includes the Early Learning Center. Pending any questions, PFM requests your approval of this contract agreement with CK Construction Group, Inc. Thank you. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 823-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner O'Grady. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. Yes. Resolution number 823-24 has been adopted. Thank you. And commissioners, if I could. No. Please. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, I just wanted to lift up some behind the scenes work that Director Reardon has been doing. As you know, we're in the midst of early voting and uh, everything that I has been never, said, um, uh, including the Columbus dispatch with folks who've gone through the process have said early voting is going extraordinarily smoothly. That of course is uh, in part due to the Board of Elections, um, but it's also the leadership of this commission of acquiring additional space and in an extraordinarily short period of time, Director Reardon and her team making sure that that space was ready for early vote, which is being used and every ounce of it is being used as we speak. And so that's a lot of times the behind the scenes work that goes into the work that we see. Uh, but I wanna thank uh, publicly Director Reardon and her team for making it happen. Thank you, Director and team. Please, thank you, please give, us, give them um, our, our appreciation. I know um, it's no easy feat and we don't get to see or hear about all the things that are happening every single day to make sure that county continues to run um, in all agencies. And so please thank you for your leadership, um, you. but for the team for all that they do. Thank you. And it truly is a team and collaborative effort. So I will carry the message. Thank you. Both please so do. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, purchasing. Resolution number 824-24, resolution approving purchases for various Franklin County agencies in the amount of $2,563,870.01. Okay. Good morning, Commissioner Sharon Sabree, representing Megan Perry, uh, our director, Megan Perry Ballonier. Uh, joining me is Andrina Austin. Economic Equality Administrator for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This resolution, commissioners, request your approval, approval of 69 purchase orders, which the county auditor has pre-certified available funding. Adrena will bring you our um, diversity data. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Good morning, commissioners and county administration. Andrina Austin, Economic Equity Administrator with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Five of the purchase orders being presented are being awarded to small and emerging businesses totaling $159,901.12. These awards are distributed as follows, 3% to women-owned businesses, 3% to minority-owned businesses, and 1% to local economically <coughs> disadvantaged businesses. Once approved, five agencies will provide equitable and inclusive opportunities to small businesses this week. And these agencies are the Court of Common Pleas, Emergency Management, the engineer's office, human resources, and the prosecuting attorney's office. Year to date, Franklin County Board of Commissioner Agencies have awarded 475 purchase orders, totaling $20,821,290.58, and pending any of your questions or comments, we respectfully request your approvals. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 824-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Resolution number 824-24 has been adopted. Thank Resolution you. number 825-24, resolution approving one purchase order for the Franklin County Domestic Relations in the amount of $300. The county has, the county auditor has pre-certified available funding and, and pending any questions, I, res I respectfully request your approval for this resolution. If there are no comments or questions, move for approval of resolution 825-24. Thank you. Yeah, second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley? Yes. Commissioner O'Grady? Yes. Commissioner Boyce? Yes. Oh, I'm saying, sorry. Resolution number 825-24 has been adopted with Commissioner <laughs> Boyce's noted abstention. Thank you. <laughs> and he was freaking out over there. Mm -hmm. All right, Board of Commissioners. Smelling salts. Yeah. Resol yeah. Resolution yeah. number 826-24, resolution authorizing non-general fund appropriation adjustments for the provision and maintenance of zoological park services and facilities. 
Good morning again, Commissioners. Kenneth Wilson, County Administrator. Uh, this resolution before you would authorize non-general fund appropriations um, adjustments in the amount of $1,054,585 um, to allow for the final payment of the year uh, to support uh, the Columbus Zoological Park uh, for maintenance and facilities. Uh, the total amount of the last payment would be $6.3 million. Um, and pending any questions, I uh, would recommend uh, passage of this appropriation adjustment. Going if there are no comments or questions, move for approval of Resolution 826-24. Second. Moved and seconded voting, Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner O'Grady. Yes. Commissioner Boyce. Yes. Resolution number 82624 has been adopted. Are there any journalizations? Yes, we have one. Case number ANX-19-24, an expedited type two annexation pe petition. ANX-19-24 was filed with the Franklin County Economic Development Planning Department on October 15th, 2024. The petition is requesting to annex 85.77 acres from Hamilton Township to the city of Obetz. The petition will be considered by the Board of Commissioners on November 26, 2024. The site is 4510 Parsons Avenue, PID number 150-000031 and 150-00069. That is it. All right, um, are there any questions from members of the media? Okay, seeing that there are none, that concludes our meeting. Have a good week, everyone. Recording stopped.